our today's guest speaker, who will talk on Ukraine, war as experience and meaning. Dr. Yermolenko is a, a, an Ukrainian philosopher, journalist, and writer who lives in Kiev, but I, I just learned that he is in Lviv and in a few days, he will be traveling to, to Kharkiv for a big, big, big event there. And he was 11 when the Communist Supreme Soviet of Ukraine, which was the parliament of Ukraine, had declared itself an independent country on um, August 24th, 1991. Well, the, the parliament didn't declare itself, but it declared that uh, Ukraine is now an independent country. And that was 30 years, 31 years ago and three weeks. The proclamation stated that Ukraine would no longer follow the laws of the, United, the USSR, ultimately declaring Ukraine's independence from the Soviet Union. Fast forward, that was to be about Yermolenko, it is going to be about Volodymyr Yermolenko. Um, Volodymyr studied in France, where he received a doctorate in political science, followed by uh, his second PhD uh, in philosophy. He's a candidate now uh, in philosophy, uh, received uh, uh, in uh, a university in, in Ukraine. He became the director uh, of analytics at Inter, Inter News Ukraine, one of the biggest and oldest Ukrainian media NGO. He is the editor-in-chief of ukraineworld.org, which is a multimedia project about Ukraine conduct conducted in English. And um, he must be a very busy associate professor at Kiev Mohila Academy. I wanted to say that I just learned that ukraineworld.org, um, um, which conducts various podcasts. One of them is known, is, is, is known as Explaining Ukraine, is about to open another program called Thinking in Dark Times. Again, that would be in English. That's why we are actually, you want, we wanted you to know, and we will post the information as soon as we, we have it. I want also to add that the busy professor at Kiev Mohila Academy is also a writer, nonfiction and fiction writer. He received numerous uh, awards, including twice Book of the Year Prize in Ukraine in 2015 and 2018. As I said, he's also a podcaster of English language podcast explaining Ukraine. He's also an anchor man of TV program Ukraina Rozumna, as I understand why is Ukraine? The Wise Ukraine, author of numerous articles uh, in international and Ukrainian media, uh, published economies in Economist, Le Monde, New York Times, Financial Times, Newsweek, uh, various interviews, BBC, CNN, Al Jazeera, everywhere. His writings and interviews have been published in uh, published in many languages, and many of you, including our fellows involved in one particular group uh, on conditions of post-coloniality, post this is a working group of the fellowship, may like to read his recent piece, a recent piece uh, by Volodymyr Yermolenko um, in July 25th issue of Foreign Policy entitled From Pushkin to Putin, Russian Literature's Imperial Ideology. The title is followed by a pull quote Russian classical classical literature, chock of chock full of the dehumanizing nationalism, disturbingly familiar today. I'm not going to say anything else. I will ask uh, Volodymyr Yermolenko to take that. Thank you, thank you, Ozbeta, and uh, thank you all. This is a great honor for me to speak and to share. Uh, our experiences of the war. I would like to be as uh, as as human focused as possible and to share with you uh, primarily the experience because the war is an abstract concept and uh, uh, behind the war there is always a, a human stories, the stories of suffering, the stories of heroism, the stories of sacrifice. 
and um, indeed this is this is something we need to uh, we need to understand and we need to follow uh, all the time uh, i think that uh, being a doctor of philosophy today or having numerous publications uh, for us is uh, no longer a a kind of a reason for for pride or something the incredible feeling that we have in ukraine is the feeling of immense equality when uh, the the people with degrees and the people without degrees people with uh, books and people without books people who know uh, foreign languages and people who don't know foreign languages are all kind of equal equal in this attitude in, in this fight together. And um, this is an immense feeling of solidarity, of brotherhood and sisterhood that we feel right now. The more you go to the front line, the more you approach to the front line, the more you have this spirit actually. And this is probably one of the things that, uh, that really needs to be felt and needs to be analyzed and understood. Uh, it, my lecture is not an academic lecture, it's rather some essayistic form of sharing what I think. So excuse me for uh, probably being incoherent and chaotic. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm now talking with air raid sirens uh, and it's, it's a little bit disturbing. So if you hear it, uh, I don't know if I need to apologize, but this is the real acoustic reality in which we're living right now. So the word is experience. Um, it's important to understand, I think, that this experience is extremely diverse and we, we cannot really unify this experience under something, something, something unified. Each experience is so unique and mm, so difficult to share, difficult to communicate. We are we're traveling a lot through, across Ukraine to the places which, were, which suffered from the war to the villages which were destroyed, uh, to places which are close to the front line. We try to talk to people as much as we can. And uh, for example, we can talk to, we talked to a, a woman in, in Irpin who lost uh, all, all her houses. They had several family houses in one place. And uh, she literally has nothing nowhere to live and uh, she just says that she will never come back to this part of the town Irpin where she where her house houses were actually staying and we should we should understand that usually in Ukraine houses is something that you build with your own hands it's not something that you buy on a mortgage loan or whatever it's really something that you build for 20 years sometimes so the war is this that you in in 30 seconds you can lose something that you were really uh doing with your hands for 20 years but then of course much much more horrible uh suffering is is the loss of human lives and uh, uh just an hour afterwards after we talked to this woman we went to bucha uh, to this car cemetery in, in these cities around Kyiv, Bucha, Irpin, Hoston, and there are so-called car cemeteries where there is a collection of burnt uh, cars and usually these are cars of people who were trying to escape uh, during those very hard times in late February, early March. And um, a man approached to us and said, pointed to one of the cars and said he recognized it and it was a car of his neighbor and friend. And he even pointed to what he called probably could be the remnants of his bones. Well, turned into dust, of course, into a kind of uh, white matter, uh, white ash. But he, he, this was a big man, uh, kind of big physically, and he just couldn't stop crying. And he was telling us this story that his neighbor was uh, evacuating from Hostomel and uh, they were shelled by the Russians. Uh, their car was burned totally. And it, it 
assumes that he was burned inside the car. But uh, his wife and two of his daughters saved their lives. The daughter unfortunately lost her hand. You probably heard a story a few days ago, a few weeks ago, maybe circulated about the girl with the uh, with the prosthesis. And I, I think I, I didn't have time to connect these two thought stories, but I think this is the same story. Um, so this is it, and of uh, and of course, I mean, when 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 you have such a situation not only the loss of, of your, your beloved one, but the loss without a capacity to make a decent funeral, without the capacity to, to find a body. This is, this is extremely difficult. And um, we have to understand how many people, thousands of people have this story in their families right now. Uh, I have... I see a lot of people on the streets of my hometown, Brovary, a lot of women with, with this tragic, uh, I don't know how to say it, Hustka in Ukrainian, right? Or the, the, black, the black, black coverage of their head. And uh, I just can, can, can assume that these people have lost, uh, lost their, 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 their beloved ones. And here comes the very, very important thing is we talk a lot in Ukraine, of course, that this war unifies the nation, and this is true. We no longer talk, we're no longer talking about east-west divides. We no longer talk about language divides. We no longer talk about class divides. Uh, of course, Putin did a lot for integration of the nation, for unification of the nation, consolidation. We should not forget that this side of the war that Everybody has this unique experience, which is in, which the, each person, of course, can share by words, by some other things. But substantially, this experience is very intimate, and basically, there are no words to describe it. And uh, I think when when we are talking about the war in humanities, in literature, in in, in philosophy, in art. We should understand two things that first of course we should talk about the war we should not keep it in silence because one of the problems of the ukrainian culture is that it went through so much suffering in, in the 20th century and earlier that in some cases it was just unable to speak in some cases it was of course uh, forced to be silent to be it was muted uh, during Stalinism, during uh, Russian Empire, etc. But in some cases, it was just unable to speak. And uh, those of, of, of us who study ethnography, who study folk songs, I think they notice how much, uh, how much of, it, of, it, of this silence is in Ukrainian folk songs. Uh, so this is a dilemma. And by the way, Elizabeth, you, you mentioned Sergei Jadan. We talked with him recently when we were in Kharkiv uh, during one of our previous trips. And, and he, was, he was telling us, us that, look, I'm not writing literature uh, now. I cannot write because there are no words that can match, match the reality. And on the one hand, I fully agree with him. On the other hand, I think that we should write and should speak. So this is a kind of a dilemma that it's writing during the war or talking about the war is a kind of a blasphemy. It's blasphemous because you cannot really match the reality and you cannot really share in, in a dignified way, share this experience of this loss and pain. But at the same time, we should do that because we should kind of communicate this Communicate is, of course, the, the, not, the, not the good word for that, but um, to make other people at least know at least a little bit. Uh, let me just, uh, after this personal uh, introduction, let me just share a few maybe philosophic, philosophic ideas, uh, not ideas maybe, but some also reflections, what this war is teaching us. The first thing it is teaching us is that the belief in progress is very naive. Uh, 
a few days ago, there was a, a meeting, annual meeting of Yalta European uh, strategy. And there was, we talked with Elizabeth uh, with, about Timothy Snyder and Timothy was interviewing um, the first lady, Olena Zelenska. And uh, I have a big sympathy to Olena actually. Uh, uh, and and the way how she behaves right now and she said a remarkable thing which is which actually expresses my what i have been saying since 24th of february but, but in a one beautiful phrase we had too much faith in the calendar by calendar she means that the more we we we, we go in time the better we become so the more we go into the future uh, the better we become. And I think this is profoundly wrong. Uh, sometimes we are asked, how do you think these atrocities are possible in the 21st century? And I'm replying, so why do you think the 21st century is better than the 20th century or the 19th century? What made us believe that we became morally better? And here, I think, an old guy called Jean-Jacques Rousseau was right because he was telling us that technical progress doesn't lead to moral progress. He was thinking that technical progress actually leads to moral regress, which I think it's also wrong, but at least he was right in understanding that in the moral side, we, we maybe our history, human history is maybe a history of going of a circular, circular way. And there is no, no uh, ground to believe that 21st century will be better than the 20th. Mm -hmm. the, second th the second conclusion is that our civilization is very fragile. Our nations are very fragile. As far as I see from the distance what is going on in the Western societies, what strikes me is uh, the fantastic suicidal uh, rhetoric inside some profound and, and very good democracies, as if the citizens, some of the citizens were trying to uh, kill the very, uh, the very fundamentals of the society, which basically helps them to de develop and exist. So I think this suicidal nature of the today's democracy is something very, very disturbing. This um, trend to see the key problems of democracy inside the democracy itself and, and its basic principles is also very disturbing. For me, we should think that I think that our experience of this war shows that the civilization, uh, it's not something as, uh, that we call sometimes system, very horrible, very inhumane, and which cuts our freedoms, whatever. Civilization is very fragile. Civilization is like a baby. And uh, it can be just dis destroyed in, in, in a few days. And we should do our, do our best to protect it. As Ukrainians are now, the, the attitude, our attitude to our country can be compared to the attitude of the mother towards her child or father towards his child. We usually tend to believe that it is our motherland who is the mother and we are the, its children, but it's vice versa. Uh, it seems that Ukrainians believe that Ukraine is their baby and you, can, you, you should do anything possible to protect it. Uh, you should avoid the doings, the, any doings that, that can put it in trouble. And for example, this is how I explain why so many people stay in Kharkiv despite the fact that it is shelled literally missile strikes every night. Uh, we spent some, times in, some nights in Kharkiv, we understand what it is, uh, when uh, basically there are 12 missiles per, per, per night and uh, you're just reading a telegram channel and it says the first missile was launched, it will fall down in two minutes and uh, you just don't, don't, don't know whether where it will fall in two minutes. But so many courageous people are there, and I'm talking about civilians, and of course, so many courageous people are, are on the front line, and so many civilian people went to the front line. This is just, just incredible, just incredible. 
So Ukrainians consider the nation as a baby which needs to be protected. And this is something, something remarkable. The third, uh, the, third thing, this, the third observation is that there is a remarkable value of life in the Ukrainian society. And maybe it is, I'm sure it's, an, it's, an, it's not a, a characteristics of, of Ukrainian society per se. I'm, I'm, I'm very far from idealizing it or telling you that, well, Ukrainians are in any case, in any aspect better than others. No, uh, I think today's situation also shows a remarkable solidarity and uh, uh, in America, in Poland, in, in Britain, et cetera. Uh, but Ukrainians are now in the situation when, which, of course, uh, makes us a little bit think differently, behave differently than in a, in, a, in a normal situation. But what strikes me is how this instinct for life, uh, for caring of the living beings is so widespread. Uh, just a few examples. When we come to um, a town, Makariv, and we see one of the streets which were totally destroyed, which is, by the way, called Szlachetska Street, right? Mm -hmm. from, from Szlachta, uh, the Polish and Ukrainian term to, 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 uh, to mark the aristocracy. Uh, but it was a, not a, a name invented now. It was an old name, a pre-Bolshevik name. And uh, guess how it was called during Soviet Union? It was called Illicha Street, meaning the Lenin Street. So it now uh, gets back to its uh, earlier name. It's totally destroyed. And, uh, and we see a house of a piano teacher. And we see the burnt remains of the piano. And there are flowers uh, around it, blossoming flowers. So the, the, the house is in ruins and there are blossoming flowers. And we ask a neighbor because we couldn't find this owner, of course, we, uh, but then we ask the neighbor to tell her story. And she says, yeah, this person comes to this house. She lives nearby and she takes care of the flowers. On another occasion in a village called Moshun, we were near two destroyed houses. We met, met a family which goes from time to time to these houses and they were planting cucumbers, the field of cu cucumbers. And they were inviting us to these ruins to taste the cucumbers. Sometimes people are very, of course, upset and, and crying, but sometimes they're smiling. And when we ask, when, we, when they tell this story, and when we ask, why are you smiling? They say, oh, you know, we, we are alive. And we, we felt so, um, so remarkable, remarkable gratitude to, 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 to the fact that we are alive and that nothing else matters. Uh, so, and in, in any other villages we go, people near the destroyed houses, they, they're cultivating their land. Their land, they are peasants, they're cultivating the land, they seed something for the next year. So despite all these horrible things, People are continuing to, 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 to cherish life and to see something for the future. And here comes a very important metaphor, uh, which is present in the Ukrainian culture, which is also uh, given by Vyacheslav Lipinski, who is also the Pole for, by origin, Polish, uh, ethnically, po ethnically po Polish, and one of the greatest Ukrainian thinkers. And he has this list the letters for, I don't know how to translate it into English, for bread cultivators or grain cultivators. And I was always kind of a... Bread growers. Bread growers, maybe. <laughs> and I was always perplexed by, by this metaphor. So why should I consider myself as a bread grower? I'm not a peasant. I'm living in... I'm very urbanized for in this... Well, actually, in this second, third, third generation of urbanized people. Why am I, am I a bread grower? But now I understand what he meant, actually, because he was not sending his letters to peasants. He was sending his letters to the whole Ukrainian society. And his message was how to overcome the class differences. It was an, an extremely anti-Bolshevik and anti-communist text. And, 
this metaphor of bread grow is very interesting because it shows the, 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 the relation to time, which is a relation to time that in order to have the future, you need to do something in, in present. But at the same time, you cannot guarantee your future because you, you just invest into something, into organic growth, and it will probably depend on many other things in life. So this is, this, this is a very interesting attitude to time, planning on the one hand, but readiness for unexpected on the other hand. And I think it's, it's very interesting. The next conclusion is this um, specific feeling of the humaneness of geography. How in this war, despite its tragic things, how it rehumanizes geography, rehumanizes places. Basically, well, the sad truth of this war is that, of course, many names of our towns and villages we know through because of the news from the front line. But then we go to these villages, we talk to these people, and we, we fall in love with, with them. Uh, we are now visiting Kharkiv much more often than we have been visiting in, in peaceful times. And during peaceful times, well, relatively peaceful times, I could not, frankly speaking, fully understand the, 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 the strength of Kharkiv and how important it is for Ukraine. And now I'm just wearing the T-shirt, Kharkiv, Zalizo, Beton, and, um, you know, it's, it's part of my reality. So I really think that Kharkiv is a kind of a fortress, a city fortress like Chernihiv, like Mykolaiv, like Mariupol, like, like many others. And those tiny places, tiny, tiny villages that you would never go probably in the peaceful times. Now we rediscover them and it becomes so close to our hearts. The next, uh, and maybe I will, I will wrap up a little bit, um, I'm sure you, you would have probably many questions about Russia and geopolitics. I can answer all, all them, but um, it, it became my, my principle that I have, I have a lot to say about Russia. But frankly speaking, as a philosopher, as a historian of ideas, if you are interested in, in my estimations, I would, of course, give it to you. But I'm, I'm much more interested in talking about Ukraine and our experience. And I think this is... This is very important because our struggle against Russia is, of course, very important for the whole Europe anti-imperialist and anti-colonial struggle. But it is important by talking about Ukraine not to switch into another talk about Russia. So uh, another, another conclusion is about what's, what's happening to the people. And... Um, Empirically, we have recently, uh, as Beta mentioned, my podcast, our podcast, Explaining Ukraine, which is done by Ukraine World. I re really invite you to listen to us. We make two or three episodes per week. Since 24th of February, we have done 70 episodes. So you can imagine how big work it was invested. And uh, we talk uh, about, uh, about what is going on, but we also talk about ideas about Ukrainian culture, about Ukrainian history, etc. But I have another podcast, which is called Kult, which also mm -hmm. we're making with my wife as Explaining Ukraine podcast. We are a very, very productive family. And, uh, and uh, in Kult, which is a, a podcast in Ukrainian about culture, we have recently made a podcast, an episode about Nietzsche with Taras Luty, one of the uh, famous Ukrainian philosophers. And Taras told me that, look, the, the major concept that how he tries to understand Nietzsche is the concept of overcoming, of self-overcoming, self-overcoming. And, uh, well, uh, uh, well, it's not about Nietzsche. I just found this concept very interesting, how at a certain moment people overcome themselves and become some, somebody different. Uh, frankly speaking, talking about myself, I cannot say that I become somebody, somebody different because of the war. I'm, I'm trying to do a lot of things which I never done before, like volunteering, for, for example. Well, never done, done before, but not a, 
on this scale but uh but i would not say that i just transformed somebody different but there are lots of people who did that who went to the front line for example but at the same time even people who did not do that uh when we talk with people uh who were on the very difficult conditions of, of occupation and they really went through something very very dramatic and i would probably call it over self-overcoming because for example in makariv we talked to a woman who is a director of the cultural house uh, so she was actually a director for all these little uh little dance clubs dance schools or, or uh, festivals and she was organizing the evacuation of her of of the whole town so she would she would find buses she would find people who would drive these buses uh, she would sit in her car and, and drive this column of several buses through the uh, through the shelling and when you talk to some such people you understand that uh they have come through something that uh that makes makes made that made them much 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 stronger than before and uh as as one uh, one woman told us in in a village lukyanivka just an ordinary uh, sales sales woman in a shop she told us look we are not afraid of anything anymore because we we went through such such a reality uh such 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 horrible things that there is nothing in the world that can can scare us so i think this is something present and i hope this will become one of the basis of this future ukrainian society which i hope will be much much more different although of course i mean there are risks everywhere always there are risks that people will come back to the inertia and we we cannot uh, deny this risk as well therefore i sometimes say that ukrainians are now showing their capacity of the impossible and uh, this is also makes a difference with with russians i think although i promised you not to talk a lot about russia but uh, but i think you know this russian slogan we can repeat mozhem povtarit which is one of the major slogans right now in these years which meant that we can they can repeat uh the, the big war against european countries as they did in 1940s as as they have think that they have beaten nazism uh, now they will beat you know collective europe as they they consider collective europe and collective west as nazism as well and by the way, when I wrote this piece uh, for, to foreign policy from Pushkin to Putin, uh, which I frankly speak, I don't, don't like the title, it's the title of foreign policy. Uh, but, um, but I just quoted Pushkin, his, his poem to the slanderers of Russia, who was telling the same actually, <laughs> was telling uh, in, a, in a way in one phrase, if you, to summarize this poem, that don't intervene with our Russian efforts to crack down the Polish uh, Polish uprising. If you will intervene in our inter-Slavic uh, controversy, meaning Russian right to oppress the Polish uprising, uh, we will repeat what will ha what 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 happened in 1812, meaning the the war against Napoleon and Russian Russian forces in Paris. So this is kind of also present and, and 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 repeat in russian imperial imperial narrative uh, but why i'm telling that because uh, this idea we can repeat actually means if the only thing you can is to repeat then you you cannot so you cannot do anything new if the only thing you can is just to repeat the past then you have no capacity of the future and maybe this is this is a big difference with ukrainians because ukrainians don't want to repeat the past our past was was tragic dramatic horrible not only when we were victims but also when we were also uh, killers like uh, like in volinia 
uh, against the Polish uh, population, po Polish citizens, or in pogroms against the Jews uh, numerous times. So for Ukrainians, I mean, Ukrainians are not really seeking this glory in the past. And therefore, it, it makes us much more open to the future, I think, than, for example, Russians uh, today. Um, and maybe I will conclude right now on a general philosophical idea, which I keep repeating in my texts all the time, that we really need to look at this struggle, Ukrainian struggle, in a broader history of, of the world, of the global history, and in particular on the aspects of a eternal fight against the idea of the republic and the idea of the empire. The idea of the republic, res publica, which the word coming was a latent translation of the Aristotelian word politeia, which actually meant that politics is the common affair, affair of everybody. Everybody should participate in it. It's a common thing of free, free and responsible citizens. And the imperial idea, which considers politics as top-down approach, when you have the emperor, which is sanctified by something, either by God or by the laws of history or by some, some other things, and uh, which who do, does not really need the freedom of of, of citizens to, to implement his or her goals. So I think we, we really need to look at the history of Eastern Europe through these lenses and interpret it in the way that the 18th century was a century when the certain Republican spirit, which was present through Rzecz Pospolita, yes, we can criticize the statehood, but still it was not and not, uh, not imperial, I think it was much more kind of a Republican, maybe feudal Republican, but in a good sense of the term, or the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, or the medieval Rus uh, centered in Kyiv. They, they, were, they were not empires. They were rather these polities, very quite pluralistic polities. And uh, the Republican idea was present in the Eastern Europe for many centuries. Uh, again, in many aspects, it was just a feudal idea, but, but not an imperial idea. And uh, starting from the 18th century, when, and I think the key date here is the loss of Swedish and Ukrainian Cossack army to the Russian army uh, under Poltava, in Poltava in 1709. From this, po and from this point, the, the, the Moscovy Tsardom was transforming itself into the Russian Empire under Peter I. And then there was this expansion to Eastern Europe. And then the remarkable events took place almost at the same time, the partitions of Poland, the loss of uh, Ukrainian Cossack autonomy, uh, and the first annexation of Crimea, Crimea Khanat. It was all in 77, uh, 70s, uh, 1770s. And I think from that moment on, we can talk about the, the victory of the imperial idea in Eastern Europe. And this, this idea, imperial idea, lasted through the Russian Empire, lasted through the Soviet Union. And the first cracks, I think, uh, began, uh, the first real cracks began, of course, in 1989. And uh, in a way, what is going on is, is a continuation of the spirit. So when I hear, for example, that there is certain criticism of the spirit of 1989, that there is a naivete behind the spirit, I think that, of course, there is a naivete, a certain naivete, but in a sense that 1989 believed in inevitability of the liberal democratic victory over authoritarianism. We know today that it is not inevitable that regress is possible, that revanchism, totalitarian revanchism is possible. But in a way, of course, this Ukrainian struggle is, is continuation of that. And this is a big struggle that revitalizes the old Republican idea, uh, which centered on freedom and dignity over the imperial idea, which is centered on, on, on tyranny. 
Uh, and therefore, I think this struggle is really global and has a global meaning. I will stop on this point and will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you very much. It struck me how your um, talk complemented the one that Yaroslav gave us on Monday. That was a, he gave us a macro picture. And uh, this, those micro elements of that big history that you started with introduced us to, and then how you frame that experience for us, I think is something that is a big gift for us. So thank you. I, um, um, the, the way we are going to go now from now on, we, we have three fellows uh, who will join uh, you in a conversation, who will enter into conversation with you. And let me just introduce them. They are going to show up, I guess, gradually on the on the webinar. John Paul Gore, who is better known as JP uh, or PJ, and, and then and the, and the, uh, the candidate in philosophy at the New School for Social Research, um, whose background is Californian Filipino, and who is working on the project uh, uh, entitled. Life on the Line. I thought you might be interested in that, Vladimir. Life on the Line, Patochka and Fanon on the Violence of Modernity. Uh, the second fellow that we are inviting here today is Olesia. You, she might be your student, and I'm not sure, but she might be a student because she's a sociology student from Markovich, Olesia Markovich, who from, from Kiev Mohila Academy um, in sociology, you know. Um, who whose original PhD project had to be dismantled and rethought because of the war. She simply could not do it anymore. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the reality she wanted to start is gone. Um, she's working uh, tent tentatively on post-colonial political identity and regional identity. Udipta Chakrabarti, our third fellow, who was born in the eastern state of Assam and brought up in Delhi, India, um, is a doctoral candidate in sociology uh, at the New School for Social Research. He's interested in populism and uh, the, the, the project that he's working on this semester in the course of that, uh, of, the, of the fellowship, is entitled The Populist Boomerang from the Post Colony to the West. Um, we have people with us. Uh, I hope we have everybody with us. Oops, I just I just muted my, uh, myself. And um, so we have everybody here. Um, maybe we'll start with um, with PJ. Uh, thanks, Elfeda, and uh, thank you for your talk, Vladimir. Um, you know, as as Elfeda read you know, uh, or said a little bit about my research. Um, I'm, I'm sure you can just from that short snippet, you know, get a sense that I'm very interested in, in many of the things you say. And, but in order to keep it short, because I think so much of uh, what you said is right up my alley in a way. Um, but I think in, just ask the question uh, about, you know, the different things about the humaneness of geography, the importance of all these um, stories of you know, these personal stories uh, in the villages uh, or throughout Ukraine with the people that you've met and, and the way they've, you know, interpreted uh, not only their kind of resolve to continue and value life, but to sort of not be afraid of anything uh, as as one of the, the women that you spoke to is saying, right? So you have this kind of rich uh, texture of all these uh, folks, but I think in the way that you told it, you know, as much as you're giving us a sense of the, the vastness of Ukraine, what, what's so in, what's so important is the kind of intimateness, and to return to the some of the things you said, the uniqueness and or the kind of the locatedness of their narratives. And I want to sort of map, just sort of ask the question about how you see the connection between the richness of those accounts and why it's important to communicate those things, and this last bit about republics. Uh, you know, let's hope sooner than later, uh, Ukraine can begin to, you know, rebuild, uh, or you know, if not rebuild, you know, 
uh, continue to modify and adjust, you know, their kind of quality, um, there, there becomes a problem scale. I say that because, you know, like, yes, you know, Politeia was about, you know, the people's things, but, you know, but, you know, the Greeks were thinking about, you know, uh, you know, it was much smaller, you know, city states, right? But then to think about, you know, you know, res publica as a Roman term, thinking about the organization uh, of the Italian peninsula now becomes a way in order to a large, you know, swath of land. So yes, you know, I think there's a lot of things that you're saying are rich and great about, you know, how we can learn how to put things in global history and all these things. But on, on returning to the kind of more practical bits, how can how can a kind of, you know, polity or a kind of Ukrainian society begin to organize itself around, on the one hand, something like a common uh, uh, set of uh, aims, but at the same time preserve, you know, this kind of, mixed temporality, right? This kind of tension between two futures, right? The kind of false sense of a kind of future which is continuously moving forward and more progress, but balanced with a not so um certain not an overly circular future, right? Because you don't want to repeat the past, right? So there's so I think somewhere you said somewhere like on the one hand, you know, the present opens the future and on the other hand, you know, you can't guarantee it. And that's the space in which, you know, life is shaping uh, and, and you're learning and seeing this kind of a similarity amongst those continue to value life and, and I like the kind of bread war stuff but anyway just to keep it short like to get to the the long story short like how how does one match you know this this aim for something that's more republican or direct democratic um with something like uh intergenerational um communication, but hopefully that made sense. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. I think the matter, the, the question of size is, of course, uh, a, a big question, because uh, as any society, probably, uh, Ukrainians were not traveling too much before this, uh, bef before this total war. And uh, one of the one of the problems, for example, with uh, with our regions, especially the eastern regions, was that the majority of citizens there did not just leave uh, their regions in uh, in their lifetime. Paradoxically, this changes during this war because many people travel for different reasons. Some of them as refugees, some of them as uh, soldiers we have like our Facebook right now when we fo focusing on uh, people on the front line is either very tragic, meaning the necrologies and, uh, and photos of, of the, the friends who were killed or the fantastic enthusiasm about how beautiful Ukraine is, in particular in these lands where, where the fights are now going on. And uh, one of the interesting things is to, well, interesting, don't want to use this objectifying term, but very important things, I would say that uh, people in different places can join together with, with kind of similar experience. I started my, my introduction with an idea that all experiences are similar experience. For example, when in 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 in, in Makari that I mentioned, you, you meet people from Volnavaha, from those eastern parts of Ukraine who are now occupied. And in February and March, these people in Makari and Volnavaha had the same situation. There was this situation of shelling, of destruction of Russian forces coming in, etc. But the difference is that Makari was liberated by Ukrainians and Volnavaha is occupied. But the the people communicate, of course, between each other from Volnavaha, from the Eastern Ukraine, from the Central Ukraine. And there is no this gap which existed in 2014 when, uh, when only one territory of Ukraine was, well, the big one, but, uh, but still relatively small, 7% of the territory was, was touched by the war. And frankly speaking, many people, for many people, the war was still an abstraction. So I think this, this leads to this re, re, newly Republican spirit when, when we understand, Ukrainians understand that this is, this is about common thing. This is about something we, we, we are doing together. 
and in a way this different this size it kind of a, ukraine gets smaller not in in a territorial way but smaller as as to reach out because so many people already have the experience of so many places and uh, by the way an interesting thing is that ukrainians who uh, left ukraine who who if you know who found, found refuge in so many uh, countries of europe talk about i think 8 million people or something like this uh, they also have the kind of a much wider experience right now because majority of them haven't ever traveled abroad or they just went for a couple of days or for tourist vacation and now they're rethinking of what they see because their starting point was that look we are underdeveloped country europe is our ideal in terms of welfare etc I dream to go to Europe to earn big money. So all these utopian, basically, things and fantasies. And uh, now people are facing the real Europe, which is, uh, which is not always as good as they thought. And uh, this also gives them an idea that probably our country is not that bad. And I think this is also kind of increased this, this, uh, this feeling of republicanism. I mean, by republicanism, I mean that the more citizens that don't have this patriarchal vision of the society that the state should give them that or is able to give you that and deprive you of that. Republican spirit means that we all are in a way co-owners of our or co-participants of our, of our political community. So this, this would be an answer to your question. Thank you very much, Volodymyr. Uh, let's, let's move to Olesia, who sent us an email this morning saying that I just arrived to Kiev and I'm so happy. She drove from Lviv to Kiev and she's home, I understand. And um, Olesia, um, sociologist, PhD in sociology of Kiev Mogila Academy, is currently rethinking her, her PhD proposal um, project and um, and what she's going to do here is post-colonial political identity and regional identity. Olesia. Thank you, Elzbieta. Uh, thank you, Volodymyr. Uh, it was, it's, it's a pleasure to meet you virtually. Unfortunately, we never met uh, in Kiev Mahal Academy or elsewhere in Kiev. But again, um, I've really enjoyed your, uh, your talk, your lecture. I, uh, I should tell that uh, your experiences are quite similar with those that I have. And uh, as Beta mentioned, I uh, came back to Kyiv uh, today. I left in mid-March and uh, spent this time in um, Croatia at my uh, husband's ho home. And uh, I cannot say that uh, I was but since I was out of Ukraine, I was out of this reality. No, you cannot escape from that. And uh, I, I have my own uh, story how we lived through the, those first weeks of war. And um, while in Croatia, I was helping other Ukrainians from Kharkiv, from Mariupol, from Hostomel, uh, from Brovary to find um, some temporary home in, in, in Europe or just in, 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 in Croatia, wherever I could. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I I heard a lot of stories from them, and that 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 creates this kind of new reality uh, for which nobody was prepared. You 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 cannot be prepared for for, for war, uh, neither emotionally nor mentally. It's something that strikes you, something that disrupts your life, and then uh, after that, you you have to re define the things even those things that you thought you, you that you thought were solid and that's uh, that reflects to what you, you just said about uh, the new definitions that uh, the war in Ukraine uh, make people rethink who they are from the global uh, from the global level of uh, civilization the, they bring new definition of civilization if uh, we talk in simple words so it's uh, civilization is basically comes to a question when it became so hard to tell good from evil and uh, that's 
the, the, that's how you you see where you are moving. Um, your definition of identity. So uh, again, as you mentioned, uh, there is uh, no uh, split, no division uh, based on the region, on language, on ethnicity, religion, whatever. There is something, something is being built, some new political identity is being built. And I think it's built on some core values of which we didn't think much before, but now they are becoming very vivid and uh, we, have to, we have to develop them. Um, new positioning. Um, Ukraine, our country was usually uh, perceived as a frontier, as a borderland. And now it, it becomes a heartland, a place where tectonic changes are happening and they are not just tectonic changes for Ukraine, there are tectonic changes for the region, there are tectonic changes even on, the, on a global scale. Um, so a lot of things are happening here and uh, also uh, the, the, what, what you said that uh, we have a new definition to impossible. Uh, when uh, in, in Europe, in the European Union, I was talking to different people and I was telling them how life in Ukraine looks like they were shocked. They said, but no, it's not possible to harvest grain under direct shelling, but it's not possible to have all logistics and food production and processing working while the war is going on. Uh, it's not possible to go to a restaurant while, because, because the war is in the country. Uh, but yeah, it's possible. And uh, what, what is very important for, for us living in this condition is just to uh, grab the sense of normality and, 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 and stick to it. And uh, this, is, this leads to another topic that you mentioned, the resilience. Uh, but resilience, that just my, uh, my impression, resilience is uh, nothing without uh, love for life. You can survive uh, physically, but you will be empty inside. And when you patch these cracks, when you patch these damages with love, uh, then you, 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 you keep this integrity. That's your story about the flowers in this destroyed house. I also hear million of similar stories from, from my friends or friends of friends who, who come back. Um, it seems to be a very irrational choice. You come back to your home, it's half destroyed, you have to buy new windows, new doors, you have to buy firewoods and install some heating devices for the winter, but you buy flowers, you buy, you buy flower seeds just to make this space beautiful. So I think that this uh, part adds to, to, to our resilience and to our uh, to our value of life. Um, so uh, this is just my, my quick reflection on, on what you said. And uh, again, uh, to, I, to, I totally, totally agree with the, um, how you framed it. And uh, I have a question for you. Maybe it's not philosophical, it's rather historical. Uh, but uh, we had th this war, of course, is a major tectonic change. But we had a lot of um, events in uh, in our recent history of Ukraine, uh, starting from the uh, revolution, of Granit, revolution on Granite, so-called students' revolution uh, that was claiming independence of Ukraine. Then we had uh, Orange Revolution of 2004, um, Revolution of Dignity, then uh, which which uh, basically um, which defined, which started kind of defining uh, this nation as, as, as one, but then uh, the Russian aggression in the East happened. Um, and this war is a very, very uh, painful and bloody uh, exercise of decolonization. So why do you think it took us so long and uh, why Maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the previous tectonic changes also contributed to decolonization. But why now? Why it took us such painful uh, step to be, to, you know, to get rid of, of of the colonial past? Why didn't it work out before? Thank you very much. Hmm. Thank you, Alessa, very much for these remarks. Uh, let me first 
answer your question maybe to then to reflect of what you say on 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 previously why it took us so long i think we need to read this post-soviet history in a, in a little bit different way as we accustomed to it i think we we need to read it in the way that soviet union did not collapse in 91 and it continued to exist in a in a different form uh I, I, I'm, I'm giving this metaphor of uh, suzerain vassal relations. So Moscow did control the whole space in the 90s and in, into 2000s. And, uh, and uh, it was gradually losing this control. Ukrainians were increasingly going very evolutionary, actually, initially. If you look at Kuchma, who is a let's say very how to say it i don't want to use this word ambiguous because he's really guilty of the murder of the journalist and of other people so he's not a positive guy of course in in my scale of values but even under kuchma ukraine was slowly drifting towards europe and was for the first time declared that its goal is uh, to join eu and nato in the law and there was some other other things so i think that russians believed until a very long time that they can still control ukraine by by different means in the 90s they were controlling it uh, economically culturally informationally all the ukrainians were watching russian television looking for watching russian entertainment shows etc by the way, I think one of the role of Zelensky was to, with his quartal, which is also not, not my thing, uh, and uh, Ukrainian, like in humanities, we, of course, we love to mock with, about quartal and all this stuff. But I think he, he did reorient the Ukrainian audience towards the Ukrainian inter entertainment product. Volodymyr, please explain quartal for those of us who may not know. Quartal is a, the, the, the most successful humoristic show in Ukraine, uh, which was done by Zelensky and his team, Quartal 95. Mm -hmm. And then it was a production studio that uh, created lots of movies, including The Servant of the People. Uh, so it was, of course, very much colonial content in Russian with no understanding of the Ukrainian reality, Ukrainian culture. Zelensky himself is a very kind of a colonial person, I would say, that gradually discovers Ukrainianness or Europeanness in himself, as many of us, I think. I think many of us went through quite similar evolution. And um, and yeah, but but coming back, Russia was controlling it, uh, and uh, Quartal was yeah very colonial product, but still it was a Ukrainian colonial product. So it was a gradual step. There, are, well, there were lots of these gradual steps, which of course uh, many Ukrainian patriots wanted to be much more radical. Uh, and it's at a certain moment, I think it mid to mid two thousands. Russia understood that it, it, it has very little impact, much less a little uh, impact on Ukrainian politics. And therefore it, it started the, the gas blackmail. The first gas war was from 20, uh, uh, 2006, if I'm not mistaken. And it was, it was of course punishment for the Orange Revolution. Mm -hmm. So Russians tried to blackmail Ukraine economically and then to discredit Ukraine in, in the whole world, see, saying that Ukraine is, uh, is uh, picking uh, or how it is, stealing, stealing Russian gas, which, is, which was, all, of course, a, a major disinformation operation uh, of, of, of Russia. Then they, they succeeded in bringing their, their politician, meaning Yanukovych, to Ukrainian, to, to Ukrainian power, but then it it took only three years for Ukrainians to just kick him off because Yanukovych uh, was a person who completely misunderstood Ukraine. He didn't understand that not only the Ukrainian people and nation, freedom loving nation, but even oligarchs. He didn't understand Ukrainian oligarchs because he wanted to become the top, the meta oligarch, the oligarch over 
all other oligarchs. Whereas Ukrainian oligarchs would say to him, come on, guy, we are in oligarchy, meaning that there, is, there should be some equality between us. That, that, that's how this oligarchic, which you, you might call the oligarchic republic, Ukraine in, this, uh, in the previous decades. Let us see what it, what it, how it will turn out now. So I think that increasingly Russians were understanding that they have less and less influence. They, their last attempt was with Medvedchuk. Medvedchuk is a key Russian ally, and then uh, uh, he established uh, he established TV channels, which basically were promoting not pro-Russian but pro-Western narratives, very very. Uh, in a hard way since 2018, 2017, 2018, and then and then in the recent years. And uh, and then Zelensky canceled Medvedchuk, as you know, he 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 did a very brave, brave act of uh, just uh, putting these so-called TV channels, which were a instruments of Russian information warfare uh, uh, and spreading disinformation and propaganda. And uh, I think Russians suddenly understood that they they lost the, the last the last tool to control uh, to control Ukraine to control Ukrainian cultural information space. So they, they were really thinking initially that okay Zelensky is a person who who would develop who was making his career on the post Soviet Union who was speaking Russian who would make his comedy shows for Russian speaking population all across the post-Soviet countries, that he's our guy, meaning Russian guy, he would get things done. And it didn't happen even with him. And now Zelensky is a symbol of Ukrainian resistance. I think Russians just understood that they have no leverage and the only leverage they have is, is the war. So basically we should read this war as the manifestation of Russian weakness. Of Russian incapacity to uh, impose its agenda on, on Ukrainians. It's just a last resort, you know. They have they have no other influence because in energy Ukrainians were freeing themselves from the dependence on Russian gas. Economically, Russians started the economic war against Ukraine back in 2014, even before the hot war, and basically just dramatically reduced the 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 value of Russian markets for Ukrainian businesses and Russians will say okay they will die Ukrainian economy will die without Russian markets because Russian markets were 30 percent of the Ukrainian exports back in 2013 and it didn't happen despite the war Ukrainians reoriented our economy to other markets and that's it and and Russians lost the important economic leverage so I think this is this is what happened. And really, this war, this invasion is really a, an, um, a, a demonstration of Russian importance to have any other arguments over Ukraine. Uh, yeah. And on your previous remarks, just very briefly, on evil, I think that really um, the current war leads us all also to rethink certain, certain things about evil. First, I think we, we need to critically assess the, the famous Hannah Arendt's uh, concept, the banality of evil, not because this war shows that evil is not banal. I think it, it testifies that evil is banal and stupid and mediocre. But I think that the fact that Hannah Arendt was trying to show that the key mechanics of evil are people like Eichmann, who are just implementers of orders I think it uh, kind of uh, uh, may may lead us to misunderstanding uh, of of a certain origins of evil, and in particular origins of the cult of violence. So, when we look at these Russian soldiers, one one very specific also metaphor image I will I will bring that in uh, many villages that we we travel to, we see a, a repeating pattern that a Russian tank goes over a civilian car and smashes it. Like as if so this civilian car, usually with people inside, is considered by these Russian soldiers as an insect, which should be smashed. 
So I don't think that um, that we can understand the motivation of this Russian soldier on the tank who can kill these people with their guns or whatever. So why going over it with 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 the, with the tank? I don't think we can understand it with the concept of banality of evil. I think we need to dig dig deeper and to 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 see uh, some something like a cult or cult of violence which is present in certain societies, Russian, for example, maybe some other societies, like if you are immersed into violence, into family violence, by the way, then you kind of, a, you see the reality as, as, a, as, a, as a need to, if you are under violence all the time, kind of, if you are a constant masochist, you, you are trying to, think ways how the masochist is turning into a sadist. And this is what's happening, I think, in, 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 in among Russian soldiers as well. Not all of them, because we have different stories, and, uh, but some of them, yes. So this kind of a cult of violence that is present and uh, which is really disturbing. The second, the second thing about evil is that I think one of the reasons of this war is that and we made a podcast recently on explaining Ukraine. We'll publish it soon. This feeling of impunity, which uh, my wife, Tanya Harkova, um, I quote her all the time that she has one little phrase to express the certain attitude of Russian political culture towards justice. This, this phrase is crime without punishment and punishment without crime. Uh, and, and this kind of explains many things which happened in the Soviet Union. This explains gulags, for example, this breaking the link between crime and punishment, this statement that justice is impossible. And I think we, we really need to think in the, about, this, um, about this deeper. Uh, so, so, and coming back to evil, <clears throat> I think in the 20th century, Europe, the Western world, said this, okay, we know what is absolute evil, this is Nazism. And there is nothing that can be compared to it. And I think it was wrong, not because there is some other evil which, which is bigger than Nazism. I think we, 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 should, we should really avoid this comparison. We should just say, okay, there are different types of evil and they are all, all horrible. And uh, the Stalinism was also evil which was horrible. And in the, in the scale of the Western civilization, I think a, a, a silent thought was that Stalinism was kind of a lesser evil than Nazism. And therefore, when Ukrainians tried to do the decommunization, of course, it was many things went wrong, but the initial idea was to do that. It was a moral idea. It was an idea that we, we, cannot, um, we cannot value, we cannot have the street names named after killers, after murderers. So in a way, the current war is also the consequences of the fact that basically Stalinism was not as condemned uh, and not punished at all as Nazism was. And I think this is also something we need to think about. Let me bring in uh, Udipta, Udipta Chakrabarti sociologist from the New School for Social Research, who, uh, whose uh, second part of the, the title of the project, From the Post-Colony to the West, sounds like something you were talking about, but I think this is not exactly what he is studying. Udipta? Um, thank you, Elzbieta, and thank you, uh, Volodymyr, if I'm saying the name incorrectly, I apologize, uh, for your presentation and your reflections. Uh, I'll be brief. I have two questions um, that stem from um, what I sense are sort of ambivalences in your reflections. Uh, they might just be a result of a misinterpretation or misunderstanding. So if you could clarify that. Uh, so one is the sense of um, skepticism you've developed over the notion of progress. Um, and I'm curious to know um, who, who you're speaking for here, uh, because the idea of uh, historical movement as linear progress has been subject to questioning, uh, for example, from the post-colony that uh, linear progress always entailed violence and uh, an ugly side uh, in the third world. Uh, it has also been criticized from within Europe um, that there are moments of progression and regression. Uh, and then there's also a 
a postmodern attitude that relativizes um, and uh, allows for the possibility of multiple trajectories of historical movement that renders the question of progress uh, assessed according to some universal criteria unintelligible. Um, so, uh, if you develop, if you have this skepticism, why then contrast it to, uh, I think you, you're going back to the Greek antiquity, a cyclical notion of time or temporality. Um, so, why frame it in, in, in that di dichotomous way? Uh, and I sense that this creates problem for um, the argument you made about uh, the need for a Ukrainian imagination of a future, um, which is in contrast to the Russian uh, desire for repetition, right? Uh, so if, if Ukraine wants to build something new uh, or imagine something new, new by definition is not something that fits into cyclical um, or recurrent time. Um, the second issue, um, which is closer to my sort of preoccupation with populism, um, you said in a kind of provocative way, uh, democracy's suicidal obsession with, with the self, that the problem is somehow always inside. Um, and you juxtapose that with uh, the Ukrainian attitude of treating the political community as a baby. Uh, now, certainly the baby is subject to external threats, but it is also capable of self-destructive behavior. Uh, and I'm, I'm not so sure I accept this, again, binary distinction between, uh, you know, caring about the dangers inside uh, and the dangers outside. Uh, certainly, just to illustrate, I would imagine that having Trump in office right now uh, would be, okay, even if having a Biden administration is not as good as what the Ukrainians would want, uh, having Trump in office would be worse. Um, so how do you square this internal assessment of internal threats of democracy to external threats? Um, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic questions and, and, and very, very, very deep and strong. And uh, of course, I'm, I'm not sure that I have uh, the answers to it that will satisfy you but i think i have the answers and, and i will try to share so uh, about progress that's an interesting thing and uh, you really you are really right that well there is nothing so naive concept in the humanities or social sciences as progress right now that everybody criticizes it but at the same time, I think what lies in the subconscious of media, of politicians, at least in Europe, for example, is that Europe has guaranteed the eternal peace and uh, there will, nothing will change. And uh, war is anomaly. And, and, and let's, let, let's just do something quickly to end it and, and everything, everything will, be, will be fine again. And here I'm, I'm rather, you know, I'm rather talking uh, with Europeans than Americans because maybe I'm wrong. I think in America, uh, this belief in the eternal peace is not that widespread, uh, which, is, which is in Europe. And I think the, the mistake, one of the key mistakes of today's understanding of the European Union, which is repeated from the textbook to textbook about the European Union is this stress on peace. Because like, okay, we have the European Union and this is because of the European Union that we don't have wars in Europe anymore. Well, partially this is true, but it is wrong in two aspects. First, Europe is in, in, in very much dependent on NATO, meaning United States in terms of its security. And it's just sometimes um, uh, I, I see it in Germany and France all the time that it's, it, it just closes its eyes as if it, it, it is not existing. Uh, but the second thing, which is very important, is that uh, the origins, the intellectual origins of Europe are, for me, are not in people like Jean Monnet or, or Robert Schumann in post Second World War. They're rather in people like uh, Richard von Kudenhofe Kallergi an Austrian aristocrat who wrote a Pan-Europa treatise in 1983, I think, which was extremely, uh, extremely profound text, which in, in some aspects understood what was going on in Europe and what will go on in Europe. Just one prediction that he had is that uh, quite probably 
two imperial, new imperial projects, the Germanic one and the Russian one, and he was writing in 1922, most probably they will divide Poland again. So, and uh, this guy was telling, okay, we should do something like United States of Europe, but not as a guarantee of eternal peace, but rather as a protection against empires, in particular, the Russian empire. He understood it very well. That's it. And, and this is kind of a framing in a little bit different way. So imagining a, 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 an idea of the, of the United States of Europe, as an idea of how former empires might, may shift from the, their imperial nature, meaning Britain, France, Belgium, Netherlands, Spain, whatever else, and to form a kind of a republic of nations. This is what, what happened actually later. But why they should do that, not, not for better exchange of goods, well, this is all fantastic, or services but to protect itself against a big imperial force, which is on their borders. And I think Europe forgot about this a little bit. And again, why it forgot about this? Because it, it took the, 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 the defeat of Nazism as a kind of a final, uh, final event in history, and that was wrong. Uh, so in a way, in this, maybe in this, postmodern skepticism about progress, there is still some kind of uh, subconscious belief that yes, of course, the 21st centuries will be much better than the 20th century and those horrible things will, will not return. I'm a bit skeptical also about the concept of postmodernism and even of, about the concept of modernity. And you're right, I'm increasingly a, 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 a fan of these uh, ancient cyclical visions of history, not the, myth myth not the mythological one, but rather the intellectual ones. I mean, uh, how, for example, Polybius describes the change of regimes based upon Aristotle. I think it's much more sober way of looking at uh, politics than, uh, than we have with, uh, with a certain vision that uh, like, dividing history into antiquity, modernity, and then postmodernity. Even in this division, there is a certain linear, linear scheme. And uh, there is nothing so sober that can we read about politics than these ideas from Polybius to Machiavelli, by the way, the lots of the big tradition, which they show precisely, and it comes back to Aristotle, they show precisely how democracies fail and why they fail, at which point, what are the reasons, the causes of them. And we are living with you at precisely these points, which, which can, uh, which, I mean, if you want to, if you want to understand Trump, you, we need to read Polybius and Aristotle. They explained everything. They explained how democracy at a certain way, certain moment of time can lead to tyranny. So yeah, in this way, as, as for your, um, as for your question about, about Ukraine wanting a future, well, I think this is, this is not about attitude to history. This is all about human attitude. This is all about, uh, about our humanity. Uh, there is one, one a formula of, um, of a one Harvard professor, I forgot his name, a psychologist, who said, he gave a formula that, um, human being is an humans are animals thinking about the future so this is his definition of, of what human being is i think it's very interesting maybe it's wrong but it's very interesting so life is thinking about future is preparing for future is inventing future uh, it doesn't doesn't really contradict that by inventing future we're not coming back cyclically to to, to the past what i was talking to rather is that this drive for the future, this is absent in, in the current Russian society. Not because Russians are worse than Ukrainians, but because uh, Russian political system just cut off the possibility of this future thinking. Why? Because it just established this uh, old guy uh, system, which, which do not reflect the social changes. In Ukraine, you have politics which 
reflects the social changes, even in the generational terms. Zelensky is a person cultivated and educated in the 90s as I am. And the leading class of the Ukrainian society is now people from the 30 to the 40. In Russia is not the case. It's just no people who just uh, you know, control, control the, the situation. And in, in Belarus, the same. And to your second question uh, about democracy inside and outside, I fully agree. I'm, I, I was rather talking about a different thing. I was asking a question, why democracy kind of uh, lacks the, the faith in itself. And here, very maybe problematic, but very important for me concept of faith comes in, faith in values. So I think that in, 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 in the self-criticism, in the Western self-criticism uh, of itself, of, of, of democracy, we, we somehow, the Western intellectuals as well, they somehow lost uh, a feeling that, well, yeah, our democracy, your democracy can have troubles, but it is still uh, a, a, a fantastic, fantastic model and much better than, than these totalitarianism, which are now, uh, which are now kind of uh, exploiting the, the weaknesses of democracies against itself. So this is this is what I was talking about, and of course, I mean you're absolutely right about uh, Trump and uh, internal internal dangers as well. But I think they also come from this lack of faith into democratic procedures, into into the fundamentals of democracy. 